Okay. So Captain Taff, I'm going to go ahead and start now. Do I? Yep, go right ahead. Okay. So good evening. Uh, I'm Ivor Sharp and I'm here representing the Del Mar Foundation. The Del Mar Foundation does a lot of great things for the community and keeping you informed is one of them. The role of the community, the role of the police in the community has been in the spotlight a lot and that's why we invited Captain Taft to speak with us uh, tonight. Captain Taft attended Boston University before he transferred to UC Davis where he got his degree in biology and he did a stint in the Navy and ended up in San Diego when he was teaching at the submarine warf uh, warfare school. He's moved up steadily since he joined the Sheriff's Department and his last assignment before he came here to Del Mar was as a special assistant to Sheriff Gore. Now, you know Sheriff Gore has a reputation for an unrelenting, demanding uh, requirement for the best equipment and the best training for his staff as well as for exacting performance from his, his own staff. I met Captain Taft when I was involved in protesting the gun shows at the fairgrounds, and I was impressed with his even-handed treatment of protesters from both sides. His officers were discreet and very professional, just what you would want from a police force. Now I'd like to, you to meet Captain Taft and learn how a young man from Oakland, a young student in Boston, and a stand-in for Sheriff Gore who commands the outstanding North Coastal Station, sees the mission and the role of the Sheriff's Department. Thank you. Captain Taft? Let's see. Thanks, Ira. Um, just a, a, a mic check. Can, can you hear me, Ira? Yes. And uh, uh, Samuel, is everyone else on uh, mute? Uh, yes, I think they are. Okay, great. All right. So I'll get started. Um, it's really, I, I was very um, um, much uh, grateful when, when Ira asked me to do this. I really like doing um, things like uh, speaking to the community about a variety of different things. I don't particularly like the way that I have to do it now, which is uh, through, through Zoom, because I've always been that kind of person that uh, I really like one-on-one -on -one conversations. I like to stand in front of people uh, when they ask me questions because I feel like, um, you know, they can see that my sincerity and honesty, um, and that's just how I do business. I, I was raised that way. That's never changed. Uh, my parents taught me that uh, honesty was always the best policy, and I, it's carried with me throughout my entire lifetime. Um, so when I talk to you tonight, uh, it comes from um, the basis of truth. Uh, sometimes things that I say people don't like, um, but they're accurate. Uh, I give out a lot of good news, but uh, there are times when I have to um, talk about some of the bad stuff, not only from a department's perspective, from my deputy's um, uh, actions, uh, from decisions that I've made. So uh, we're not perfect. Uh, but I can tell you that uh, I try to give um, Del Mar the best that I can of me and my, my people. So, um, and I have a very, very high standard and that doesn't change. So why are we here? We're here because Ira asked me to do this, although I wanted to do this anyway. Uh, he just happened to get to me first and I agreed to it um, uh, immediately. A little bit about myself, Ira already talked about. I, I am that kid from Oakland. I uh, went to Boston University. I went to UC Davis. Um, I was uh, destined, I th what I thought was for medical school. However, um, you know, not having the money to go, I had to change uh, paths. And so I ended up working at a hospital in Sacramento in the lab. And then I went, uh, after that, I joined the Navy as an officer uh, for a few years. Um, uh, I've been overseas a lot, um, uh, several deployments over there, I've been in Kuwait, I was in the war. So I've, I've had a variety of life experiences which has taught me a lot about human nature and people in general. I came, I, I got out of the military mainly because I just missed my family a lot. You know, I had at that time one kid and um, 
uh, I just miss a lot of things about uh, them growing up. And so I decided to get out and join the Sheriff Department. That was 22 years ago. And uh, here I am, uh, Captain of the North Coastal Station. Uh, I've done a variety of things, uh, like Ira mentioned. Um, you know, worked the regular beat, detective, uh, internal affairs, uh, traffic, um, just a, a whole host of things. But my, my most proudest assignment is when I worked uh, for Sheriff Gore because I got to see everything. I got to travel with him and speak for him and I really got a good feel for uh, our department. Uh, so that was, that was uh, something that I really cherish. As far as the Sheriff's Department overall, I know that uh, Council, uh, you're here, so you, you understand this, but this conversation is really, uh, might be a little basic for you uh, because the residents, they don't, they may not have a, a true grasp of why they have the Sheriff's Department or why, it, why don't they have a police department? Why, what, why do they have the Sheriff's Department? What the differences are? So I'm gonna give an overall about uh, the Sheriff's Department and what we do in general. Uh, the Sheriff's Department, we've got about 4,200 uh, personnel, um, both sworn and what we call professional staff. Um, we've got 21 patrol stations, seven detention facilities, um, and, and all the courts. We're responsible for all of those um, with, with, our, with our Sheriff's uh, um, employees. Um, we do a variety of things. We're no different than most police departments. The police department, the difference is a jurisdiction, basically. Um, a police department is um, uh, a con the, their law enforcement for a city. Uh, the sheriff's department, we do law enforcement services for cities that uh, don't have police departments. So that's kind of the difference. But we all go through the same training. Um, we all are taught the same. Uh, there's no difference except that the uniform that we wear. Um, so that's that's kind of the difference between a police department and the sheriff's department. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna get to the questions because there there were a few questions that I wanted to address. Uh, a lot of really uh, uh, that you know I'll be able to answer. There were some that I really can't answer. Um, when you ask me about other agencies or uh, the way people do business in other states, I can't address that. I can only address uh, uh, what I know. Uh, what I know and what I'm responsible for. I'm responsible for the North Coastal Station, which includes, which includes the city of Del Mar, Solana Beach, and um, uh, Encinitas. Uh, when you talk about social issues or, or things like that, um, I typically don't, don't talk about that stuff. Uh, um, you know, I, my focus has always been you treat everybody the same. You can't go wrong that way. Um, what you arrest one person for or what or one particular group for, you're gonna arrest the, another person who looks totally different for the same thing. And so my approach has always been, you treat everyone the same and you don't have any issues. Um, so I won't get into any social uh, issues. I won't talk about uh, uh, social agendas of, of any particular group because for me, it's not what it's about. It's about making sure my deputies are professional, that they're doing the right thing, that they're, that they're within uh, uh, the legal parameters of the law and of policy. And it's, it's making sure that, that they are um, performing the service that you pay them for. And it's as simple as that. Uh, so um, in, case I, in case there were some questions about that. So let's get into how we're trained because that was, that was kind of one of the, the first big questions that came up. How are law enforcement officers trained? How are deputies trained? So the way it starts off is uh, you attend an academy. The academy, most of the, acad most of the people go to the academy at Miramar College. It's about a 26 week program or six months uh, is what it is. Uh, you're trained in a variety of different things, laws, uh, tactics, uh, um, shooting, defensive tactics, um, uh, um, uh, other types of training that we do that there's just such a a, a a host of things that that are listed that are required by the state of California. So the, the officer or deputy gets through the academy and they graduate. Uh, uh, once they pass all the tests and there's a there's a series of tests that they have to do 
written tests, a physical test, um, a verbal test. There, there's a, a host of them uh, that they have to do in order to make it through the academy. Uh, we do have some that fail and um, uh, they don't make it through. So six months or 26 weeks to the academy. Uh, once you get to the academy, then you're assigned for the sheriff's department. You either go to a, 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 the courts or you'll come to patrol. We'll skip right to patrol. So when a deputy comes to me who's right out of, out of training at the academy, he goes right back or she goes right back on training. Um, that training is what we call phase training. And there's basically three um, sections of phase training. Uh, first, second, and third phase, which each one's about a month long. And then on top of that, you've got traffic, detectives, um, you may be with cops, uh, deputies. So uh, all in all, your training after you get, after you get out of the academy is about another um, four and a half to five months before we actually turn you loose on the, on the, uh, um, by yourself. So there's, there's a, the extensive amount of training. So you've been in training for about a year before you actually step into a patrol car and get out there and start handling calls. So I want people to understand that. Now, does that mean that training is over? No, it's not. It's not, we, it doesn't, it, training for us never ends. There are certain requirements by the state that they, they tell us that we have to uh, do what we call continuous professional training, which is 24 hours every two years. That's by the state. But our department does a lot more than that. There's training, we do it. We do briefing training. We do online training. We do in-person training. Uh, there's a lot of department training that goes on outside of the mandatory uh, requirement of the state. The big thing is, well, are deputies trained to de-escalate? Are deputies trained to handle calls that involve someone who's uh, having some sort of emotional breakdown, things like that? So that's been the kind of topic that has uh, swirled around uh, over the last, you know, six months or so regarding are deputies able to respond effectively to a call where a person is having some sort of traumatic uh, uh, breakdown or mental breakdown or they're just having a bad day. It happens. Uh, yes, we do. We do. We've been doing um, that type of training for a few years now. This is not just because it's become uh, the center of attention or topic does not mean that we haven't been doing that. Uh, many of our deputies attend uh, what we call a three day uh, um, uh, psychiatric response uh, type of training where uh, we go and, and for three days and we talk about uh, different uh, mental issues, uh, how to recognize those, how to respond to those, such as a person say that's on the spectrum. Well, they may display certain symptoms um, and we train deputies to recognize those symptoms. Uh, sometimes it's not that easy uh, because we deal with a lot of people where uh, their issues are drug induced. Uh, and so it's, it at times is very difficult to distinguish between a person who is say autistic or on the spectrum versus that person who is say high on PCP and unresponsive. So we have to try to distinguish between the two, but we've gotten a, a lot better at, at being able to do that. So that's the first thing deputies go to three days of this training. And then we have another additional a day uh, of training that we do. So our folks get do get a lot of training. They have for a long time. As far as de-escalation, we have been training in de-escalation for several years now. Um, we add on more. We do different things as, as things change in our society. We change with it. Uh, this is not a, you know, just because you learned something 10 years ago doesn't mean it's it's the same. We have a, a, a very proactive and aggressive um, uh, training academy, training, uh, uh, in-service in training that we do. They're always looking for creative and innovative ways, things to help prepare and equip our folks so that they can respond properly. So when people talk about deputies aren't well-trained, it's just not an accurate statement. We do a lot of that and we continuously do that. It's just that we don't publicize it. So most folks don't even know it, but 
um, many more folks continue to go through through the training. So um, the question about Del Mar, for those of you who don't know, um, you're probably wondering, well, what kind of services do we get? How many deputies do we have? Um, um, what, why don't we have more of this? Why aren't you here? I see a lot of those type of questions. So the, 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 the city of Del Mar contracts with the sheriff's department. So what that means is since Del Mar doesn't have a police department, they contract for law enforcement services um, uh, through the sheriff's department. Now, it's not like the city of San Diego. City of San Diego has their own police department. Oceanside has theirs, National City, many cities do. In the county of San Diego, there are nine cities that do not have a police department. Therefore, we uh, provide those law enforcement services for that city and Del Mar is one of them. In fact, Del Mar is one of our oldest contracts. So what does that mean? The city, has an option to decide how many patrol deputies they want, what kind of services they want. So what, they, what we do is we, we negotiate. Um, there is a, 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 a standard list of, of, of the cost associated with one deputy, one detective, one sergeant, one lieutenant, one captain. Um, there is, a, there is a, a standard cost that we charge every single city. So your city, Del Mar, has chosen um, uh, uh, a certain uh, contract. So during the day, let's just give you an example. Um, during the day for a 12 hour shift, the city has contracted for one patrol deputy um, for a 12 hour period. In a 24 hour period, you have two. So the normal deputy comes on from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. That's one deputy in the city. And then from 6 p.m to 6 a.m. in the morning, you have another deputy. Uh, and that's what the city contracts for. Now, they also contract for one detective, which uh, uh, is dedicated just to doing cases uh, for the city of Del Mar. I don't have them doing cases uh, any other place. They're contracted for the city of Del Mar, and that's their focus. So you have uh, one deputy per 12-hour shift. You have a detective. The city is also contracted for traffic services. You have to have traffic services because you have accidents in Del Mar. Uh, so you, the city has contracted for uh, one motorcycle deputy, which is what you have. And we also have uh, a deputy in a, in a car, in a black and white sedan that you see driving around. So your motorcycle deputy has been here for years. He knows the city, he loves working here. He really works well with the schools. He's very proactive and you, you folks have probably seen him quite a bit. Um, uh, so that, that's what we have. Now, what you don't see is um, some other um, uh, ancillary services uh, that are also part of the Del Mar contract. So um, again, what you're gonna see, what the public sees is you're gonna see that deputy. So a lot of times people will ask, well, why isn't the deputy here or why is the deputy here? Now remember, you still have calls for service. In other words, calls come in, you've got a suspicious person and that deputy has to respond. Um, uh, so when you ask for why don't we see the deputy more, it's because of, you know, you know they're typically maybe on a calls for service, they may be at the beach, they may be uh, speaking to a resident about some particular issue, something like that. Um, so that's why you may not see the deputy uh, as much. Now, my directive to the Del Mar deputy is when, we, when, he, when they come on in the morning, we do our briefing, they go right to the city. Uh, they go have some coffee and they come over to the city. That's my instructions to every Del Mar deputy and every Solana Beach deputy. Um, because I want them in the city, I want them driving around, I want them handling what we call handling their beat. Typically, uh, when uh, they'll afternoon and to head back to the station because they, they turn over with the next shift and then the next deputy comes to the city. So you should see 
there, there will be a short period in there where you don't see a deputy and that's because there's a kind of turnover period. But for the most part, um, uh, uh, that is just the transition in the morning and, and, and in, in the evening. Uh, now, things happen and uh, you may, there may be a, a need for two deputies. Just because the city only, only contracts as one deputy, does that mean that it, the situation that requires two deputies were just not gonna show up? Well, of course not. Uh, that deputy, if there's a call where that deputy needs to cover, they're gonna show up. If there's a huge incident, you're gonna get not only every deputy uh, at the command there that are, that's on shift, but you're also gonna get other agencies responding such as when we had the shooting at the Del Mar Fairgrounds a couple years ago, um, there were probably 200 cops there. Uh, that's the kind of response you'll get. So don't worry the fact that you only have one deputy. You will always get what you need. Uh, if it's two deputies you need, you're gonna get that. If it's three or four that need to respond, you're gonna get that. So don't worry about that. Uh, um, one deputy handles most of the calls, but there are a few occasions where there's two deputies or there's three deputies here, uh, or there's four. So that, that's kind of service. We're very flexible as far as your needs, uh, but don't think you're being underserved just because the city uh, contracts for one deputy. You're not being underserved. And if, and if you need more, we're gonna be there. Trust me, we will be. Um, so that's, that's the services that you have. Now, on top of that, you get every service that the sheriff department provides. Uh, if there's a, a homicide here, you're gonna get that. If there's uh, a child abuse case, you're gonna get detectives for that. If there's a gang problem, there's gonna be gang detectives here. Um, you get the, 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 the helicopter services. Um, you get uh, every service that we provide the city will have. You get our bomb arson people in case there is um, uh, some threat of, of uh, uh, that someone has, you know, some incendiary device, you get that. Uh, you get everything, everything that we have. It depends on the incident. Again, uh, you don't have to worry that you're being underserved because you're not. You have every resource that the sheriff's department has. If the city of Del Mar needs it, they're gonna get it uh, no matter what. And on top of that, if it's something like a shooting, uh, you're gonna get responses from San Diego PD, uh, from Oceanside, Highway Patrol, they're all gonna show up. That's the way we work in the county. We're a mutual aid kind of organization. So you're gonna get what you need depending on the call. So don't worry the fact that you've only got one deputy contracted. Yes, that's true, but you will get more if the call or the call for service warrants more than that. That's, that's how it works. So I hope that explains kind of um, how it works. I know it's, it's very, I, I tried to simplify it, um, uh, but that, that's kind of how it works. Uh, you don't have a station here, um, but we do have a, a work location at City Hall, uh, so we do have that. We just don't have an actual station here. The station is in Encinitas, um, but we do have an area that the city manager has, has kind of reserved for us, um, um, so we do have that capability. So let me get to some of the other questions that were sent in, um, and I'll try to answer some of those. Um, I already talked about our training. Um, uh, a person wanted to know if we were having difficulties recruiting. Uh, let's just put it this way. Uh, my, my, my station is at 100% staffing. Um, we, I think we've gotten down to maybe one vacancy or two, but for the most part, uh, we are 100% staff. That has not changed since, since uh, uh, the pandemic has started. Didn't change anything for the service we provided. Um, it really didn't have that kind of impact. Uh, we don't get days off. It doesn't matter uh, what we're going through. Uh, we're a 24 seven operation. Our folks didn't get days off. I didn't get a day off. Uh, there were many days I was here uh, uh, at night uh, on the weekend. Uh, that's the nature of the captain's job and I accept that. So I'm not 
even close to complaining about that. But you were not impacted by the pandemic, COVID, nothing. Um, you're fine. Um, there was no shortage. And uh, the North Coastal Station is 100% uh, manned. And that, that was the, uh, the impact of the uh, pandemic. That was a question that someone sent in. Now, another person wanted to know about PERT which is uh, one of the things that's kind of the hot topics going on. Uh, PERT stands for Psychiatric Emergency Response Team. We have that at North Coastal, which means Del Mar has it. Um, we what, what PERT is, is you match up a deputy and a, a psychiatric nurse. They work as a team. And the calls that they go to are calls where a person is having some sort of mental breakdown, suicidal, uh, things like that. So they, the deputy and the, and the nurse go together. Now, um, we have two, so, and each one has their own deputy. They work uh, different hours. We try to cover as much during the week, but remember they're not 24 seven. Uh, we try to schedule their times during um, uh, the peak times where we, where we have the most calls. But for the most part, they're not 24-7. Uh, many people ask, uh, uh, so the purpose of them is so that we have a trained uh, a psychiatric person to communicate with them and try and assist them in whatever they're going through right now. The deputy is only there uh, as uh, uh, protection for the nurse uh, to make sure that no one gets hurt, uh, but they don't play any role in these uh, calls. When we go in, the nurse goes in, we go in with the nurse, the nurse does all the talking. Uh, um, and then typically uh, uh, whatever the nurse determines is the best uh, solution, and that's what the deputy does. Uh, so we essentially are working for the nurse. We're just there uh, uh, for protection because, you know, uh, there's been a lot of conversation about uh, um, re responding to these. Some of these folks are, are uh, can in an instant turn very violent. Um, some are unstable, some are drug induced. And uh, so there's a lot of things that can happen. And it's really important that you don't send the nurse in there by themselves. Um, a majority of the time, it, it turns out okay. Um, you know, usually the person is admitted to a hospital. Um, that's, that's, the, that's the majority of outcome for most of them. Um, they get some kind of services right then. And, but, you know, most of them turn out. We've had some that, that haven't turned out so well, where the person becomes violent. Uh, and we have to take the necessary action to protect not only ourselves, but the nurse and everyone else that's in the household. Uh, but that's not the, the, the case, but um, it really is um, really beneficial for us having that nurse there. Now they respond to about 33% of calls, what, uh, calls where we, we classify them as 5150s. They respond to about 33% of those. Um, but, and deputies respond to the, to the rest. And that's why we've trained our folks with the three days of training and the one day of training, and then all the continuous training we do with responding to people who are under duress. Um, deputies do respond to about two thirds of those. Now, um, the reason they're not a 24 seven, um, um, unit, uh, but um, we feel that we are effectively trained so that we can uh, indeed uh, handle the majority of those calls. Uh, so that, that's PERT. Other questions that were asked um, as far as uh, our budgets, have we had any cuts in the number of officers uh, or civilians? No, we haven't. Again, I told you that uh, North Coastal Station is 100% man. Do we have a uh, PPE? Yes. We had that from the very beginning. Our department was very aggressive and proactive when this first went down back in March, providing us with the necessary uh, uh, protective equipment, uh, gloves, masks, um, uh, 
everything that we really needed. They really jumped right on it, ordered it, got it to us. And so our department was very proactive when it came to providing um, um, and reacting to dealing with, with the pandemic. As far as the next question, as far as helicopters, I see this complaint all the time, <clears throat> two, actually two complaints when it comes to helicopters. Uh, they're noisy, uh, they wake me up at night, and I have no idea what they're saying. <laughs> uh, let's talk about the fact that it's hard to understand what they're saying. Uh, I, I have uh, gone to the, the, the individual who does, who um, runs that department, and they're always trying to find a way so that their, their broadcast is a, is a lot better. Uh, they're still working on that, but they are aware of the fact that it, sometimes it's hard to understand what a helicopter is saying. I know in my neighborhood, uh, sometimes I'll hear a helicopter flying over and they'll be making these announcements and I'm not sure. The way I've tried to solve that is that when we're gonna do helicopter announcements, I try, my folks are trained to put it out on next door. Uh, that's about the best way I can to try to reach uh, a, a large amount of people because this community loves next door. That's great. Uh, but there's a lot of misinformation on next door also. But uh, what we do is all of, all of my supervisors are trained to put it out. So if we're looking for a person, once things kind of, uh, uh, once they can, they get on next door and they put out, hey, we're looking for this person last seen here. This is what they look like. This is their name. Uh, so uh, that's what we try to do with the helicopter. Now, as far as the uh, complaints, remember, <clears throat> The, our sheriff's helicopter isn't here that much. A lot of people think it's sheriff, sheriff's helicopters, but remember, we've got the military. You've got Coast Guard helicopters. You've got news helicopters. You've got sightseeing helicopters. And a lot of times, it's not us. I'll get complaints about why is the sheriff's department flying at you know midnight down the coast. And I, I look and I go, no, we weren't. we weren't actually out there. Uh, and it's the military flying a route, or it's some other, or it's the Coast Guard, but it's, it's, it's um, a lot of times it's not the sheriff helicopter. Uh, but again, uh, sometimes it is, and typically, probably 95% of the time, I just want people to, to understand, 95% of the time, we are usually looking for someone who is lost. Uh, whether it's, uh, typically it's a, a, a person with dementia, um, or a suicidal person, or a child. That is the majority of what our, our Astria helicopter is out doing. Uh, um, and, and those are the majority of, of their calls, that's that sort of stuff. So when you're hearing those announcements, most of it is we're looking for a person. Person asks, are we prepared for wildfires? Do we train uh, and manage to evacuate? Uh, yeah, it's one of the best things that we do. I can guarantee you that we, have, we get extensive training every year um, uh, on um, uh, firefighting, um, evacuations, working with uh, uh, the local fire, working with state fire. We work together as a team. Um, we handle the evacuations. Uh, typically fire will tell us uh, where to uh, start evacuation pe evacuate people, which way are safe routes. So it's a very well-coordinated um, operation. We are really good at it too. I'm not just saying that. We are really good at it. Probably because we've had so many of them. Uh, we've had lots of them. So are we prepared? Yes, we are. Again, I would tell you if that was if that was not true, I would not sit here and tell you that it, that that's the case. We are very prepared. We get training, extensive training every year, and we have on the job training. So our folks are good. We know how to um, evacuate people uh, and because we've done it for so long. We're just, we're just good at it. And you have a great fire department. I, I'm really impressed with how they fight fires, how they manage them, how they control them. Uh, you should be very proud of your fire because they're really true professionals and very good at their jobs. <clears throat> Let's talk about <clears throat> mask. Okay, that's a, another hot topic, uh, mask enforcement. Um, the order, the, the, the governor's order um, 
started back in March. And um, I have to admit that there's a lot of aspects of it that was, that was very confusing for people. Not everybody keeps up on the latest order. And it seemed to be changing every week or two about what you can do, who can be open, what you have to do, what you, you know, it just, it was very confusing to residents. We in law enforcement, we're not confused because we get, we, we look at it, we figure out what, we, what should be done and what shouldn't be done, but not every resident does that. Many don't. And so we take that into consideration. There's a lot of people who simply don't know. They don't pay attention. Just because you pay attention doesn't mean they're paying attention to it. They simply don't know what the latest order is. And that, that changes too, because what the state says, the county can um, uh, be a little bit different or, or uh, tighter on the rules. And so the state orders might be different than the county orders. And so we really, our goal from the beginning was, was education and compliance. Um, uh, that was what the direction was from our sheriff. And it's simply because people don't know. You, you just can't go out there and just start citing people because of this or that. You really, I found that if you just talk to people and tell them, most people are actually compliant, especially in this community. Um, they just didn't know or they just needed to be reminded. So the majority of people are compliant. Now remember, the mask rule is not, um, you don't have to always wear a mask, okay? There are certain uh, uh, situations and conditions where you don't have to wear a mask. Um, for the majority of the people here, they do. They're very compliant. But what has been effective is having a presence. That has been very effective. So it was, it was very smart of the city to, um, uh, you know, sort of uh, invest in this um, uh, mask enforcement, you might say, because we found that there are people out there who simply, they walk, they don't have a mask. Uh, we ask them, we tell them what the rules are, what the, order, what the latest order is, and 99.99% of them are compliant. It's just like when we go to a business uh, and we let them know, hey, you can't do this, they would usually comply. Um, the other way we get compliance is simply through our presence, where we don't have to say anything. I was talking to a deputy the other day uh, who was doing mask enforcement in Encinitas. The, uh, uh, they pull in, they see, the, they get out, they start unloading their stuff, they see the deputy is there, uh, they go back to their car, get their mask, and then go down to the beach. So a lot of it is simple presence. That makes a huge difference because they know we're paying attention, which we are. We're paying attention to that. So presence, uh, talking to people, educating them has worked for us 99% of the time. Now, do you occasionally get someone who is just absolutely defiant? Sure. I don't. You can't do much with them. They simply say they're not going to do it. They're not going to do it. The only thing we can do is a write them a citation, and that's what we do. If you didn't know, this area has written more citations than anyone in the county. Uh, uh, so uh, I'm not afraid for my folks to write citations. If anyone thinks that I am, then they need to look at our numbers and see that uh, Captain Tapp has written more. His people have written more cites than anyone in the county. Again, 99% of people are very compliant when it comes to masks, but it is working, a presence, being able to hand out masks. Uh, our deputies are, love that. They love the fact that they can get out there, their presence, and the fact that they can give a mask out versus a ticket. Uh, they would rather do that, and it's working. It really is. So it was a, it was a good investment by the city uh, to do that, and they didn't have to. But uh, they did, and I, I thought that was a very good thing to do. Uh, fairgrounds, a lot of people are wondering about the fairgrounds. Uh, let me make sure uh, time, okay. Uh, a lot of people are wondering about the fairgrounds. Has it had an impact on crime in Del Mar? Yes, it has. It has had a significant impact on crime in Del Mar. Now keep in mind, Del Mar does not have a lot of crime. Uh, we do have crime, but it's not significant. The fair, uh, as uh, unfortunate as it is, I'm not, I shouldn't say the fair, but the fairgrounds, as unfortunate as it is, all that crime gets counted towards the city of Del Mar. You can't get away from that. 
uh, that's how uh, it's looked at. Uh, now, I can tell you this. When I looked at stats from January to June of 2019, we had about 90 calls for service at the fairgrounds only, about 90. Now, remember, you got your fair, you got concerts, you've got all these different things that are going on there. Uh, you know, Kaboo's not during that time frame, but you've got, you know, a lot of large events going on at the fairgrounds. We had about 90 calls for service. Uh, from, and then that was 2019. In 2020, from January to June, we had seven calls for service. That's significant for the fairgrounds. But again, those 90 calls back in 2019 all go to the crime rate for Del Mar. That's, that's how it is. Uh, again, so this year, we haven't had that issue. Uh, seven versus 90, I'd say that's a pretty big impact for the city of Del Mar. Again, Del Mar is a, honestly, a, a relatively safe place. You live in a great city with a great view, I must say, uh, but there is crime here. The people who commit crimes in Del Mar, most of them are not residents. They come here and take advantage of people's naivety, uh, of people's complacency. They take advantage of people just feeling comfortable and safe. Um, uh, and we'll get, I'll get to that to wrap it up at the end, but, but uh, most of the people, uh, most of the crime here is from people who don't, who don't live here. Uh, and it's the same in Encinitas, it's the same in Solana Beach. People come here and commit crimes. Uh, but again, the city is a, a, a relatively safe place to live and it's a great place to live, honestly. Uh, I can't afford to live here, but you know. <laughs> uh, so that's the fairgrounds. Um, Let's see here. So at, uh, just to kind of wrap this up, uh, uh, three more questions. Uh, have you noticed any different crime trends in Del Mar uh, I, uh, since the pandemic? No, uh, it hasn't really. Uh, the pandemic has not changed crime trends with, ex uh, uh, with the exception of that the fairgrounds has less crimes because there's, there's no activity there, uh, but no. Uh, Residents uh, um, and let's see. Okay, so let's let's wrap this up. So what what do I need you to do as residents? Uh, this is really important because I have been preaching this from the time I got here, and I'm not sure why this community does that, but they do it a lot. Uh, and I just want to be honest with you on what I need from you, uh, because I consider us a team. We work together. There's a lot of things that you see that we don't see. Remember, you, you have one deputy um, who, who can only be so many places. What I need from the residents, I need you to call me. I, not me in particular, call the sheriff's department. When you suspect a crime or something just doesn't feel right, you got to call us. Emailing council, emailing the board, emailing your cousin or your brother or your sister or putting or posting it on next door is not the best way to handle something which is occurring right then. It's okay if you're going to do that. If you're going to post it on next door, that's fine, but please call us first and then post it. What I get is, yeah, I saw a person um, breaking into a car and they put it on next door and they're just, what? Well, why didn't you call us? And they didn't even call the sheriff's department. So I need residents, please. I need you to call the sheriff's department. That's what you pay us for, honestly. There, I don't care how many times you call or how much you call. Uh, you pay us to provide a service for you. And we're gonna do that. But I need you to do this for me. If you suspect something suspicious, call us. It may be no crime, but at least we can show up and go, okay, there's nothing happening here. Uh, so I, I need you to do that. And then you can post it on your next door or your Facebook or all of that. That's, that's fine. But never say, well, they're not gonna do anything anyway, or they're not gonna show up. Uh, we are gonna show up. Uh, we better show up. 
And if we don't show up, then complain about that and I'll find out why we didn't show up. Uh, again, I have high expectations for my folks. I trust them uh, to do the right thing. I hold them accountable um, uh, when they don't and no one's perfect. I, I get that. They're, some of them are young, uh, uh, but you know, uh, still, I just need you to call us when there's an issue or you think there's an issue and you don't know, call us, we'll come, we'll find out, we'll come. If it's a requirement, if we need two deputies to show up, we'll have two deputies show up. If it's a situation where we need three or four, there'll be three or four, okay? So I wanna leave you with that. That's critical uh, so that I can provide you the best service possible. And um, that's all I have to say. Uh, oh, as far as the number, non-emergency number. Now, you know, if it's an emergency, you're going to dial 911. Okay? It's simple as that. The non-emergency line is 858-565-5200. Now, what happens if you can't remember the, the non-emergency line? Well, you get a hold of us any way you want to. Okay? Uh, typically, our, our communication center is staffed 24-7. We on average, answer 911 calls under 10 seconds. Um, uh, I know because I was the captain there. Uh, so you, there's no excuse for not calling us. There, there simply is no excuse. Um, so that's what I ask of you. I need you to help me out because I need to be able to know that we responded to something. And if it turns out to be nothing, then it turns out to be nothing. That's okay. I'm okay with that too. Uh, but that's what I'll leave you with. Um, well, I Captain Taft, um, thank you very much. I, I'm sorry we got off to such a rocky start and some of the people didn't make it to here, but we will post this on the uh, website of the Delmar Foundation. And if you talk to any of the people who did plan to attend and didn't make it, we'll have a chance to see it. But I want to thank you very much. And I'm sure everybody who is, is here tonight knows why I'm so pleased and proud that we have Herb Taft as our captain in charge of our station. I think he's just wonderful. He's got the right attitude and, and everybody I know is very proud to have you. And thank you very much. And yep. Thank you everybody. No problem. I appreciate everybody who attended and I thank you. Oh, I see some hand claps. Okay. Oh. <laughs> All right. Good night, everybody. Thank you. All right.